Hey everybody, I'm Kyron Loggins and I'm here this week with Xavier Brown. We're gonna be talking to you guys today about activism, uh, the intersectionality of art and activism, and just a little bit about, you know, navigating the world as a young black man in 2021. Um, so before we jump into things, Xavier, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, yes. Uh, hi, my name is Xavier Brown. I am 20 years old. I, a, I attend UCLA right now. I am an acting a student there. Um, and I act, I screenwrite. I also have my own clothing brand called Brightside. And I also have my own film company called Magnum Opus Media. Definitely a lot. So you're out here moving. Uh, can you tell Fine. us you went to, um, you go to UCLA. Can yeah. A little bit of uh, insight about, you know, your academic experience in your youth um, and kind of, you know, what aspects of school were formative for you as a young black man? Yeah, um, I always saw education in general as very important because especially as a young black man, you know, you don't want to go out into the world and interact with other people people who already judge you a certain way and for them not to think that you're educated or you don't have a good head on your shoulders and um that really sucks but you know that's just the world that, that we live in um and through education you know I think that we would be able to change that so um yeah I think education is really important I think my experience at Bishop O'Dowd UCLA St. Leo the Great School in Oakland you know um have all been very formative to how I even was able to get into UCLA. Um, so yeah, I think education is very, very important. Definitely. Um, and I guess I would ask you, you know, like early in life, what were your goals? And if you could have like written your life into a book as a kid, what would that have looked like? Yeah. Um, so my very first goal actually was to travel the world and to learn history um, about the world. Like that was the very first thing that I, that I wanted to do. Um, and I'm still very interested in history. Like it is my favorite subject in school by far. Um, and I just love learning about the, the world, the cultures and everything. Um, but arts have always been a huge a, a part of my life. So naturally um, a lot of my goals were uh, very, oriented with the arts um so uh you know everything from being in a marvel film to writing my own um, a movie which i just a, a completed um you know to uh um having my own clothing brand which you know i i also do like these were all goals that i set forth for myself um to uh do when i when i grew up and the fact that I'm able to do that right now allows me to see even more goals. And I'm like, okay, now that I have this done, let's look at, you know, what's uh, there to do next. And just speaking about goals in general, I think it's really important that you always have those huge goals in mind, but that you make sure to think about, okay, what can I do right now to get there? Like, or like, what, what can I do within this next week to really improve upon my skills so that I can not only speak it into, in, into existence, but I can also uh, follow through. Definitely. So. You know, you talk about, um, I guess you have like a lot of different projects, you know, that you do and a lot of different in, endeavors that you're working on, but I want to uh, zero into your work as an activist a little bit uh, right now. And mm -hmm. so I think I would ask, you know, in your work as an activist, of course, I'm sure you address tons of things, but what are some of the main issues that you're passionate about? Um, of course, Black Lives Matter. Um, that's probably number one uh, for me right now. Um, uh, also, um, just uh, protesting for a, a better earth, um, just, you know, uh, taking care of the environment. Um, and then, of course, uh, LGBTQ rights. Um, I think that every single person, no matter orientation or race or, you know, everyone should have the rights um, that we're all supposed to be granted. So I think um, all of those things just have to do with, you know, just basic human rights and just 
making sure that everything has the love that they uh, deserve, including the earth that we are on. So those are the main things. Um, how I do that, I do that in everything I do. I think one way that I protest Black Lives Matter through my art is whenever I write a screenplay, whenever I sell a screenplay, whenever I, I write a film, I make sure to not always have my Black characters play stereotypical roles. Because I find that in Hollywood, there's always the stereotypical, you know, gang member, maybe even a slave or like someone in the sports industry or rap industry. Like, you know, there's there's all these stereotypical roles. And growing up, I've always wanted to see just films where it just showed Black people living a, um, like a, I, I don't want to say normal life, but like a normal life with like a black twist, you know, like. Yeah. I, mean, I think I think I hear a lot when I when we talk about representation in media is, you know, there are lots of or there aren't that many, but we have black characters, but we don't have many characters who happen to be black, you know, exactly. Think, you know, exactly. Yeah. And I think that that's uh, what you're getting at. And it's very important. It's profound to have you know, characters who their Blackness is not a plot point or it's not exactly. like they're Black and we have a character who's going to get shot or arrested or this and that and the other. Yeah. You just have a Black kid just sitting and eating lunch and that's just their story and that's it. Yeah. Yes. I yes. What you're saying. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And just to add on uh, to that, not only like, you know, characters who so happen to be Black, but because they're black like what like little like flares do they have like they like you know like just as, as you said it's a black kid sitting down eating lunch but he could have you know like um some sort of west african food because who knows like he his family could be from west africa or like his hair is a certain way just certain little black flares that make us black but it's not like it's extremely stereotypical you know that like so. bridge between stereotyping and tokenism and how do you yeah. be authentic in the presentation of black especially and i think that this is something that you know um as an artist you deal with of course as a black man but i think this is something that non-black artists even deal with is especially right. like if you're not black how do you write a character and you're true to their blackness and you're authentic to that and it's not erasure or you're not just saying here we're gonna write this character and plug a black person in for re representation, right. which we're also not saying we're gonna write a character and we're gonna write a black character. I think anytime you go into anything you're saying we're gonna write a black character, you do give yourself uh not only do you write yourself into a whole artistically, but yeah, when we talk about, you know, as a we look at it as a social issue, it's not real representation. Right. Um, right. Right. Yeah, definitely. I guess yeah. as a segue out of that, uh topic though i would ask you you know like i think it's hard to be not conscious in our generation and to not be aware yeah. of what's going on yeah uh, but if you were to say an event or you know a particular thing that happened that kind of caused you to be conscious and mark the beginning of consciousness towards social issues what would you kind of attribute that to uh oscar grant probably um you know, like at the time I was like eight, nine years old, even though I didn't go out and protest, um, I thought that that story was always so crazy to me. And it honestly made me afraid to ride Bart mm -hmm. just like gr growing up. Now, I I told myself, you know, like when I was like 14, 15, that's when I really uh, I began to ride Bart, you know, like you always have to um you know just make sure who, who who you're around and everything but the fact that a black man wrote bart and because of just the time and place you know his life had to end like that really 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 scared me when i was like nine so that just made me more conscious of the world that we live in um and how people uh, 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 uh perceive me you know even from when i was 11 my mom always taught me when you go into these other white neighborhoods or these other stores, don't have your hood on. 
you feel me? Like, you know, like don't do certain things because they will see you a certain way. So, um, yeah, I'd say it all stemmed from, from that a moment in time. I think that's very unique to us as well. You know, like Oscar Grant, not only being from Oakland and, you know, experiencing when that happened, what it felt like, but also, you know, with Fruitvale Station as the movie, uh, that was a big resurgence of a lot of those feelings, um, a lot of that conversation. And so I think for those of us who were, yeah, you know, like you say it happened when we were kind of young, a little bit too young maybe to put those pieces together. I definitely think, um, and words of Ryan Coogler, that Fruitvale Station was a film that kind of put, brought that full circle for us. And so mm. something that we heard mm. a lot and we got to see a lot of uh, in the news as kids, we saw it in a different format. And I think that mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. stylizing of it, it does, especially for if you were around and you were a kid when that happened, uh, you get to kind of really identify with Oscar Grant as an individual, even beyond yeah. knowing that he was you know, from Oakland like you or whatever else. And I think that that, um, for me, when I notice the radicalizing or just the consciousness of a lot of people on our age group, it comes from the fact that we're looking at these things happening and we're seeing ourselves in these people. Uh, mm -hmm. Especially when we look at things like Trayvon Martin and Tamir Rice, people who are around our ages when these things happen. I think that that right. has a lot of impact on like, it could be me. This is right. exactly a problem of someone else now. Exactly. Um, but I guess my next question for you would be, uh, if Oscar Grant kind of made you conscious, what shifted you from conscious to active? And what kind of, you know, inspired you to get a little bit more involved with activism? Um, well, to be real, um, act activism was always an important part of my family, my, my uh, mom and, and dad always made sure to tell me to fight for what I know was right. I always looked up to Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, you know, I even have the autobiography of, of Malcolm X. Um, but I'd say what really pushed me to do like, like, like really, really, really take action was George Floyd, um, without a doubt. Um, and although I have taken action before George Floyd, like that's what really pushed me. Like, like I, like there, there, there probably was nothing that enraged me more than that. And also what came after it. Mm. Um, Definitely. Yeah. I would like to um, honestly get more into detail about the protest in Oakland on June 1st that you were uh, a major part of organizing. Kind of uh, one, not only how was, you know, the emotional process of, you know, organizing somebody, something not only to honor, but in a way to avenge somebody who, you know, went through something crazy and dehumanizing, but also what is that process like uh, just as an organizer logistically? Can you give us some insight into that? Yeah, yeah, without a doubt. Um, my brother um Akil Riley you know I've known him since I was four years old you know when he texted me you know saying like I, I really want to protest I I, I had I had the, the exact same feeling and we just went and planned to do it and we made sure because me and him aren't really necessarily violent people um so we knew that we wanted it to be somewhere that we could speak out and really have all of these all, 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 all of this anger come out in a way that didn't seem violent. I wouldn't say it was peaceful necessarily because of how everyone felt, you know? It's not peaceful. It was it was a lot, it was a lot of anger. But um yeah, doing that for George Floyd, like at the end of the day, it was it was for George Floyd. So you know, I, I felt very somber um, when planning it, to be honest, because I knew that I was doing, I, I was, I was doing this because of someone dying, you know, like that, like that's, that's, 
that's so crazy to think about but um yeah to be honest like the whole time i felt very somber and very emotional um but in terms of the logistics um we pretty much set out a schedule of what we wanted to do where we wanted to go um and we put out a flyer and then from then um certain organizations reached out to me and a queue to you know try and help so from then we planned with them about you know um you know like we want a speaker uh we want a microphone we want like some we 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 want some sort of like truck we want a place where um people can get masks and hand sanitizer and even food you know um we want to make sure everyone is um, everyone is uh, feeling welcomed, even the kids. Um, but what that, but as it grew in the span of, I want to say four or five days, uh, uh, we caught the attention of a lot of the a, a, a police force. So we even had to talk with them a, a lot. How, how many people showed up to this protest? Yeah. So there was there was over. So it's huge. Yeah, yeah. There, 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 there was over fifteen thousand um, people there. I, I, honestly, I want to say it was a bit more, but that's like the numbers that people say. Like the entire street of Broadway was like, you know, just like closed. Um, and here's the thing: when when me and Q planned, we thought at most, like at first, we thought at most fifty people would show up. At most. And then, um, you know, Akil was like, bro, I don't think anyone's going to come. And I was like, to be honest, bro, you know, and like me and him both agreed, like, even if no one comes, like, we still want to do this, you know. Yeah. Um, and even the day of, we thought, OK, you know what, it's 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 going to be a solid a, a thousand people. We never would have expected that many people to show up to something that just two teen t- that two teenagers planned. Um but yeah no it was it was pretty crazy even the day of i like i like i like i I don't i don't think anyone saw this but right after my speech i had to talk to a lot of the uh, police officers about certain things just to make sure that everyone was safe just to make sure we were on the same page that this is not going to turn into a riot and i don't want any officers like trying to act out or you know anything along those lines so even during you know it was a lot of making sure everyone was safe um at the end of the day um but yeah definitely and i think i guess another question i would have for you just in regards to that is what was like in the aftermath of that how is it kind of empowering to know that you have like that ability even if like it didn't change the law that day that everybody got together, you know, what is it like knowing that you can organize something like that? Um, I think it feels like, like I can inspire a a generation, um, or like, just like my peers around me, like after that protest, I can't tell you how many young people reached out to me or just went out and did it themselves saying, oh, I was at that protest and I wanted to do something like that. Or, or like, oh, like I saw that on the news like, and, I, and I wanted to speak out too. You know, I want to say at least 20 um, other Bay Area and even Los, Los Angeles protests happened because I think it's because like people saw like, this is something that we can all do, no, 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 no matter the age. Um, something that really touched my heart is there was a kid who hit me up through Instagram? He was, she was like maybe eleven, and she was like, "Hey, I, 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 I really want to help the protest, but my mom said I can't go, so I made you guys these signs, um, and I, you know, like I just want to help that way, you know." So the fact that someone in pro- probably what the sixth, seventh grade was like, "Yo, like I want to help in my own way," you know, um, I think that it just really speaks true to how powerful we can be so i guess like just to sum everything up you know it really makes you feel powerful um inspiring um and it it kind of makes you have hope for 
your future, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. And I think um, as we reach our closing mark, uh, before we say our final farewell words, uh, my last question for you would be, what's some advice you know that you would have for somebody who sees you, you know, not only working on your art, but working on your activism and kind of would like to do something similar. What's some advice you might have for somebody who was in your position maybe two to three years ago? I'd say, honestly, um, and this has helped me out so far, um, do what you uh, believe. Um, Even if you have to do it on on, on your own, do what you believe in, Um, but do it with a purpose, if that makes sense. Um, Because I feel like a lot of people do what they want to do, but they don't do it for a purpose or like they don't do it like to actually reach something. So make sure that you set out your goals um, and you just you just go out and, and and really, really, really do it. Like I have a, a speech impediment, but I'm in one of the top acting schools in the world, you know, like anyone can do anything they put their mind to if they really work hard and they really believe like, okay, this is what I want to do. And, e- and even if that doesn't work out, at least you can say that you tried your best and then a different road can open up and you can go try out something else, you know, like, yeah. So just really believe in yourself. Um, Cause if you don't believe in yourself, then no, no, no one else will. I feel you. I love that. That's a great note for us to end on. Um, I think that's our show for today. Again, as always, I would like to thank Comcast for helping us put this all together, the Hidden Genius Project, as well for helping us put this all together and helping to host us. And uh, of course, I'd like to thank you for, you know, giving us your time, giving us your wisdom, giving us your words. And thank you. you. Pay that forward. Uh, Thank you. That's us for this week. We'll be back uh, next week. Uh, would you like to list off your businesses for the audience just so they can know where to keep up with you? Yeah, yeah. Um, my Instagram is X the Savant, X T H E S A V A N T. Um, my uh, clothing brand is Brightside. We actually just raised um, over $500 by selling shirts, and 100% of those proceeds went to the Black Feminist Project and the Equal Justice Initiative. And then my film company, Magnum Opus of Media. Um, so yeah, yeah. Definitely. All right. Well, thank you guys all for watching. Thank you for joining us today, Xavier. And we'll be back uh, next week again, talking about same old. Thank you all for watching. <laughs>